Well, first, uh, um, since I'm the general editor of the series, I'm going to pretend I'm a neutral chair here for a couple of seconds, because normally that's what I do, because normally I am the editor, not one of the authors. But um, uh, first, uh, let me just say off topic uh, that, as you heard, I just came back from the um, 76th, I think, meeting of Penn International. It was in Tokyo this year. And we had this extraordinary week because somebody who was president a little while before me, Mario Vargas Llosa, won the Nobel Prize for Literature. And uh, somebody else who, as individuals, we nominated for the Peace Prize, Liu Xiaobo, the former president of the independent uh, Chinese Penn Center, won the Peace Prize. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was really quite an extraordinary week trying to deal with whether what we could do to help Liu Xiaobo and uh, Mario Vargas doesn't need our help, uh, but what we could do for Liu Xiaobo and for freedom of expression in China. And uh, really qu quite interesting to be at the center of that and to see it unfolding. Uh, in fact, I did something very modern, which has ended up giving television interviews by Skype from the lounge in the Reykjavik airport, <laughs> which is where I happen to be. It's really bizarre. Anyway, uh, the other thing is that, uh, that um, with Adrian Clarkson, I'm the co-chair of the Institute for Canadian Citizenship, and we hold an annual lecture uh, series called the LaFontaine Baldwin Lecture. And uh, this is the 10th anniversary, and on Friday night, it's going to be in another hall, the uh, at the Royal Conservative, Conservative the Kerner Hall, uh, with the Aga Khan, who is really the great voice for a diversity in the world outside of Canada. To do with today, well, there you've got the Aga Khan speaking in Toronto all that time later uh, on those issues of diversity. Anyway, this series uh, was a wonderful idea of Penguins and, and Diane Turbides here, who's the, I would say, editor-in-chief, Grand Poobah, whatever, of Penguin who's sitting over there. And uh, uh, it's 18 biographies, 20 people since we're the two people who did doubles, so we made it 18 writers, 20 people. What was I thinking? Yeah, well, I know. I was quite interested trying to talk you into it, actually. <laughs> It was a good idea. Uh, and they're all modern Canadians. They're, in a way, they're, the, they're examples of the people who created the country as it is today. So it starts really with people like Riel and Jumont and Lafontaine and Baldwin and, and Big Bear and, and comes right through to people like Pierre Trudeau and René Lévesque. And, it's so, it's quite, and they're 200 pages long, which is not because they're short and dumb, but because they're written by 18 of the best writers in Canada. Only one of them is a professional historian. Right? Most of them are novelists, and they really know how to write a story. And novelists know more about truth than economists, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly. And, uh, and so they're, they're both true and beautifully written. And nothing like this has ever been done in Canada before. There was an attempt with the uh, Makers of Canada series about 100, and 100 years ago, but they were rather clumsy, you know, badly written, with exception of maybe the one by um, Stephen Leacock on LaFontaine and Baldwin, but uh, curiously enough. Uh, but they were not focused the way these are. Anyway, and on top of that, Ken Hirsch is here somewhere. Where is Ken Hirsch? There he is. Ken Hirsch is a filmmaker from Montreal, and he's doing a 30-minute documentary on each one of the subjects of the books. And on top of that, McLean's is doing something on it. Already half of them are coming out in French. Uh, what else have I forgotten? Do you and I get 60 minutes, since there's two? Well, that's what we, our, Ken and I were talking about this just the other night, <laughs> saying we ought to get 60 minutes I was only kidding, minutes but each. it's not a bad idea. <laughs> have you got, made any progress on that? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> we should. Um, so, I mean, that's it. It's really quite astonishing um, because it's, you know, feminists, it's activists, it's, and there are a couple of the other authors are here. Is Andrew Cohen here? He's supposed to be. Now, he'll be embarrassed if he isn't here and he, his name was mentioned. Who did Lester Pearson? Very good. He's very naughty because he said he'd be here. Adrian Clarkson, who did uh, Norman Bethune. You should at least wave, Adrian. <laughs> I don't think any of the others are here. Andrew is no doubt late at a meeting. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, the other thing I just want to say is that uh, the, their, the Baldwin family is a large family, and there are quite a few Baldwins here tonight, and I think they should just stand up and wave. <laughs> and, 
and, and David Baldwin did something, the same sort of thing happened to you, almost evil, it was so good, which is after I'd basically finished the book, I heard that he had two trunks worth of Baldwin <laughs> original material uh, that he was willing to hand over. So I had, he and I carried these trunks, steamer trunks, out into the car, and I went through them and found the most amazing stuff. And what the happened to you? The same thing with me, too. By the way, are there any Riels or Dumonts in the house? <laughs> there are a lot of Dumonts around, aren't there? No, there are Dumonts around. Uh, the Riel family kind of ended with, with uh, the death of Louis' daughter and son. Uh, but yeah, the same thing happened to me. A couple of uh, people got in touch with me just too late, like within days of my putting in the final kind of draft and everything was going to copy editing, saying I've got some really interesting... And I'll tell you one of the stories tonight, which is, I think, really neat, but, uh, but yeah, like, a little bit late, and that was a shame. Why don't you go ahead and tell the story? Well, one about, it's about Gabriel Dumont. Um, he's fascinating, by the way. I, I fell in love with this man uh, over the course of the three or four years I was working on this book. He's a true kind of hero of, of the Canadian West. He's the last of the buffalo, uh, captains of the buffalo hunt. But he would do something called calling the buffalo. But in his Sarsi language, it's not calling the buffalo, it's singing the buffalo. And so I assumed... Uh, having moose hunted, you call an animal and a large animal by doing the grunt of the bull or the, the whine of the cow. And I was, this, uh, uh, this wonderful woman explained to me, no, he sang the buffalo, it's a very spiritual thing. There was a, it's a very quick story, but he was really sick in the camp with his, uh, a number of his people uh, out on a hunting expedition. They all had this horrible sickness and none of them could barely move. And what, what Gabriel was able to do, and his, he could sing to the buffalo to call them to come to him. And he actually sang, and, the, and a lone buffalo wandered into the camp. They, they were bedridden, they couldn't get up. A lone buffalo wandered into the camp and offered itself to them. And, they were able to shoot it right there and, and kind of crawl out of their sacks and skin it and eat it, otherwise they would have uh, died. So my, my interpretation was way more uh, Western than, than Indian in, in, the, in the idea of singing a buffalo. Let me see, what other introductory thing I want to say? Jane Piper is here, who's the head of this library, which I think is the single most interesting looking, and that's a compliment, uh, public library in the world that I know. Where, where is Jane? Somewhere here. Somewhere here, and the back of the back, and uh, Bill Hamady, who works in the Baldwin Room, where there is this incredible collection of material, not just about Baldwin, but about basically 19th century Canada, and they were fantastic. I'm mean, sort of going, I would say, well, I've heard vaguely that there is, and they would go away and hunt and come out with this stuff. It's just an amazing uh, collection in this library, which is. The, the model of a public library because, first of all, if you come here during the day, it's filled with kids who represent mm -hmm. the new Canada. It's just kids from all over the world who become Canadians are here. And secondly, this is the single best place for a teenager to pick up some of your get a date, <laughs> which is what a library should be. And enough with this stuff, right? It's really a living place, this library. Anyway, so why did you give in? You made me. <laughs> I was actually, John approached me, right, Three Day Road had not been out long, it was no. 2005. Well, I read it right away and just thought it was a masterpiece. And, Thank you. And I still think it's a masterpiece. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. <laughs> but uh, John approached me uh, and I was naive and young and <laughs> he said, I'd like you to do uh, a book for the Extraordinary Canadian series and he didn't say on whom. I was like, oh, tell me more. And he said, well, do you have any ideas? And I thought, well, you know, I could do General Curry from World War I since, you know, I'd just written a book on World War I, or, or I could do Louis Riel, maybe, because he's, uh, you know, I, I have a special tie to him. And John was like, there you go. And then I said, why don't I do Gabriel Dumont, too? <laughs> that's, that's my naivete at the time. I didn't understand that. Uh, what I was getting myself into. Uh, 